No one is born a communication expert, but like learning to play the piano or riding a bike, practice makes perfect. Sometimes communication is being able to understand what isn't being said. While millennials and digital natives are more comfortable using social media and cell phones to communicate, studies indicate that baby boomers and Generation Xers still prefer face-to-face -face conversations and relationships. Media and communication go hand in hand. Stories and characters help define and motivate the lives of many, causing connections between reality and fiction to be strong, and in a sense, could even define how people live their lives. Today, with the help of four experts, we'll explore some similarities and differences in communication among the generations. Welcome to Generations. Today our topic is communication, and we have with us Professor David Pallant, who is a professor in the Department of Communication at County College of Morris. Welcome, Professor Pallant. Thank you for having me. Could you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Uh, yes, I went to University of Massachusetts Amherst for undergrad. I was a bachelor's in communication and mm -hmm. minor in sociology, and I went to New York Institute of Technology for my master's program. Um, my other background is in corporate, um, worked for Google and MTV and worked on a presidential campaign in social media. Great. Thanks very much. Why don't we just uh, take a minute to watch some of the video that uh, we've, we've gathered and, and listen to the responses uh, to the folks on this topic of communication. Sure. Thank you. Social media gives us the ability to connect with everyone using an idealistic virtual persona. But have we fooled ourselves into thinking these new connections are as meaningful as those we made before social media? On one hand, these applications greatly improve the opportunity to communicate, even with individuals and communities beyond all possible reach. But on the other hand, does anything really replace being there? communication because everybody has lost sight of being a human. Human beings speak to each other, human beings, you know, they, they have conversations. There's a lot of teenagers and a lot of young people that they rather text, they rather have um, text messages or talk to through Facebook or Twitter and then when you're in person is a different person. They're either shy or they can't have a whole conversation. I believe that social media is a good thing because it keeps in touch with family and uh, friends who you don't see often but it could also be bad when other people you don't know start looking at your stuff and following you too much. I think there's a lot of information that can be transmitted to young people. So yes, I agree with that. And then I am torn with um, with kids not learning um, social skills 
as in uh, body language. <laughs> um, I don't think we're getting it from communicating by text messaging and emailing and all that. Um, but professionally, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's a positive thing. Thank you. I think social media is um, a good thing. I think it helps improve communication. You get to keep in touch with people who are you know, far away. I've got a lot of family members and I get to see friends. I get to see the pictures of the kids. However, this wonderful a medium, I think it is. I think it's a little scary for this age. Um, it takes up a lot of time. Um, I think it exposes them to things that they're not ready to start to mature enough to embrace. And I think it's another thing parents have to do. I mean, I think it has probably been both. Uh, I think it's been very good in some respects, uh, keeping people in touch. And, uh, but at the same time, I think it's provided a lot of pressure, particularly on young people. Uh, uh, social pressure, I think, on young people. Uh, people my age, I think it's a lot of fun. People are using a lot of it for communications. But uh, you know, like I said, I think it cuts both ways. I think social media is an asset because it lets teams uh, spread creativity on other networks besides why are you on Instagram all the time? Because it's fun. You like it? Yeah. Um, I believe that social media is an asset. I have lived out of state from my family members for over 13 years, and they have been able to keep in touch with me and my family and knowing what we're all doing because of Facebook and Instagram. So I think it's an asset. I think that social media, social media is a, an asset to communications. Um, field I work, we use it a lot to kind of uh, direct people around. Uh, I'm an EMT, so we use it a lot for directing like traffic and accidents and stuff like that. So we kind of use it as a tool rather than a hindrance. I think social media is an asset because it places in contact people who would never in a million years uh, otherwise have met people of other races, religions, and in that sense, it's an asset. But any asset can be overused. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I believe social media is more of an hindrance than an asset to communication simply because it, for the most part, impedes the development of good grammar and writing skills because people are normally using shorthand when they use social media. Kids find it harder to talk to people. They don't look them in the eyes anymore. It's just personal communication is becoming a lot harder for younger, the younger generation. I think social media is a hindrance because some people can abuse it and they also can, uh, their social skills a lack when they use it a lot because like a couple of my friends, they just go on Instagram and just use stuff like Twitter and they, and when I meet them in person, they don't really, they're not much of a talker and I, and I don't really like that because I like to have a, a connection with people. We're losing our art of communication. But certainly, we've lost the art of correspondence. It's very difficult to correspond by an email, although we can't communicate by And at the end of the day, where is our mutual relationship? My understanding of you and your understanding of me, which can only come about as a result of dialogue. So that's my position on social media. So with all that said, uh, certainly there are lots of thoughts and, and opinions on the subject of social media uh, between the generations. So as a professor of communication, what would you say the, the, the impact has been of social media on communication? The impact on communication is, is we know it's instantaneous, right? It's mm -hmm. happening and it's constant updates. Um, so, you know, that doesn't always happen, right? Mm -hmm. There's sometimes delayed communication, right, mm -hmm. when it's face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. So this is instantaneous, but sometimes things go wrong, right, mm -hmm. in that process. Mm -hmm. The one thing we're missing is good communication in the definition, and most of the power of communication is the nonverbal that we have going right. on right here. Social media cuts out all nonverbal. Um, right. If you're looking at Twitter, it, it's a text, um, verbal-based communication. Um, so there's that need for that emotional, nonverbal, power, powerful effect. When you're at an interview, right, the nonverbals right. sometimes have more significance than what's being said. As you walk in the room, 
your eye, you know, your gestures, your eye contact, all of that. Um, so we're cutting all that out in social media. Um, right. And people, human beings, yearn for the nonverbal and yearn right. for the emotions. And so sometimes it comes through through text language or emoticons that right. people put in, you know, right. in the text right. revolution that we saw. Trying to substitute. Um, so there's a lot emotion. missing. Um, mm -hmm. Now we're seeing a movement in selfies, mm -hmm. where people will document, take their camera, um, document themselves, post it to social media, just to say. I am happy, I am sad, I'm at this concert, I'm here, and they're documenting kind of in a big ego way, right, of, right. of where they are every right. second of their, of their day. Yeah. But are you suggesting that they're also using that as a way to substitute, they're acknowledging, I don't, nobody knows how I really am feeling, and that requires a, a physical presence, even if it's a, a picture on a phone, but some sense of... Correct. So, so you know, there's a uh, sociologist where communication scholars look back to, Irving Goffman, and it was a book, um, The Presentation of Self. And he was talking about basic interpersonal or even the speech communication, public speech mm -hmm. communication context, this idea of theater, that oh, everyone has okay. a front that mm -hmm. they put up and a, a mm -hmm. nonverbal front. Mm -hmm. and how that is manipulated in different settings. So some of this is coming true years later via digital technologies. Um, the selfie is trying to sit, show people how happy you are. It right. may be faking it, it may be theater, right. but we do theater all the time face to face. Right. It's sometimes replicating in the digital world. Right, right. Now I understand that, that societies treat it differently, use it differently. Um, it, it's not everywhere around the world they aren't using it and, and engaging in social media the way we do in this country is that true that's very true so mm -hmm. um I, I, these are trendy things so i could see where in the middle east or, or europe maybe selfies have traveled across the world in the past three months because this is the trend right right um right. but but most of the time the way we've seen it being used in other parts of the world is for real political engagement and upheaval and revolution okay. in venezuela right now as an example um, against the brutal regime. There's young people in the streets protesting and they're using an app, um, I forgot the name, but it's a two-way kind of walkie-talkie app that they're using to speak against the authorities to mobilize their protests. And they've wow. tried to shut it down, but it's a decentralized app on an offshore account. Um, oh, so wow. that's one example. In Arab Spring, Twitter was 140 characters, getting rid of Mubarak, the dictator of 40-something of years, Gaddafi, you know, you go down the line. Um, most people had yearned but their traditional media had been controlled so much by the authoritarian regime for all these years that it seemed so much easier and it happened so much quicker. Sure. Where these types of movements right. could have taken 20 years and um, arming people, right. you know, and arming right. uh, you know, a kind of a dissident army. Um, it was the power of social media yeah. that brought down. Interesting too that in countries that we do not necessarily think of as, as advanced, technologically as Correct. we are, Correct. they still manage to get the word out via Twitter on smartphones so that they have that technology, which is great. Uh, it links them to the internet and all kinds of things, but maybe Correct. they don't have a car. Correct. Or, so you I, know. I, I think it's harder to be a dictator and an authoritarian leader right, good. in this environment. Uh -huh. That's a because good thing. Because you know, the example in Iran, when you've documented a young girl who was killed in the streets during a protest, it ran around, went around the world within minutes. Right. And it was right. hard for them to defend that or hard for them to say what happened right. to this person. So now the whole world is involved and there's a movement towards trying. It didn't work effectively, but it was one attempt in Iran right. to open up that. Um, right. So, you know, the mullahs and some of these people that were controlling it, traditional media, they weren't mm -hmm. controlling Twitter. They weren't mm -hmm. controlling the smartphones. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. the young people, are f even in this country, are a few steps ahead on the technology sure. and the use mm -hmm. of it where they haven't even written laws or don't even understand the technologies. You know, so yeah. the technologies moved quicker than common law. Absolutely. In some of these instances. Which work to some advantage mm -hmm. in some countries, certainly, yeah. Well, let's get a little more uh, specific in terms of the impact that social media has had. For example, this is a show about generations, sure. uh, young people, the pressures, the, you read about it, you hear about it, um, you have a young son, someday you'll live it. Um, how, how do you see that, that being for, for maybe good as well as evil? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think um, we've seen it in education being used for mm -hmm. collaborative type efforts. Um, you know, our journalism professor here probably mm -hmm. blogs and teaches them to tweet, mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes before the article goes out to give a heads up, you know, mm -hmm. to people that are listening. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen virtual space being used uh, to teach communication in Second Life in mm -hmm. a virtual presence kind of world. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. th there is applications um, right. in the job sector, as you know, LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, 
really a, a e portfolio virtual kind of um, networking right. outside of the traditional you know realm. Right, right. Uh, so there's huge positives. Mm -hmm, right. Now we did see a mother refer to you know her ten year old daughter and a friend, I guess, uh, maybe seeing things, being made aware of things that really she didn't feel they were ready for, and how vigilant parents need to be. Do you feel as though that pressure is something that we're going to have to reconcile somehow? What that people I think struggle with. Um, administrators, parents, people who want to censor it, it's very difficult to censor it mm -hmm. because you can't document when and where mm -hmm. the communication is happening, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So once they have a smartphone and the internet, um, there are no courses in media literacy, right? It's how right. to use Word, how to mm -hmm. use PowerPoint, right. but right. not the effect that this could be having on you. Why are you cyberbullying? Sure. What's right. the effect? It could be worse, right? We've seen suicides related to this Absolutely. type of stuff. Absolutely, sure. Um, so for a parent to just say, you'd have to take away the phone, shut off mm -hmm. all internet, Mm -hmm. But somehow their friend has it, or they're getting a Wi-Fi signal at, at school, right? And mm -hmm. it's happening in all different places, in different contexts. So the stuff they would do in the locker room, or in the hallway, texting or uh, photos going up, um, they don't see the consequence to that, right? right. Different right. than if they're in the classroom or they're at home in a structured way. Right, you know? right. Um, so you spoke a little bit about higher education and how sure. that, um, the uses um, in your classroom. Uh, certainly we have online courses. I don't know, that's not mm -hmm. quite social media. Uh, how do you see it being used? You t spoke about blogs. So there are... Yeah, um, a, a class like this, which is filming mm -hmm. today at County College of Mars, our, mm -hmm. our TV production students, they could post to YouTube get comments and, uh -huh. and build kind of sure. a, a grassroots movement around the generations right. program mm -hmm. um, and have a broader reach than Mar than just Morris County. Right. Right. It could get big in Russia. You know, mm -hmm. it could get popular show mm -hmm. if it's marketed and placed out there on a social media site, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. has the right strategy to it. And know? certainly LinkedIn is valuable for, for students getting ready to go out into careers and so on. So it's another kind of professional Facebook, you might say. Sure. Let's just go to a quick quote here. Um, Father John Colkin, who's a professor of communication at Fordham University, said, and I quote, first we build the tools, then they build us. How have these tools of social media kind of recreated our society? Um, I, I would say that people are, um, it's something I had talked about a few years ago, uh, you know, being in an online presence so much throughout the day, um, it creates something I had t started to write a few years back, a technophrenia, a technological oh. um, schizophrenia almost. Mm -hmm. You're creating such a different identity and a different mode of communication mm -hmm. that is quite different than what we're doing right here. Right. And there's different consequences and there's not as much oversight and there's so much freedom. And, and you can be an alias and be a different identity, right? Wow. Um, yeah. So it, it is almost yeah. like the way we always switched and had our presence of you're at work and you non-verbally look this way or you talk this way and then with your friends you talk different mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. here there's a whole online presence yeah. that's been developing you know that it's it's normal to steal mm -hmm. and download music mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. see the consequences of intellectual property right. there's a distance you would between never do you that you would never do that in, yeah. in the real world right because yeah. there would yeah. be a consequence to it yeah yep. um, so that that's a strange um, mm -hmm. issue that I think people are going to have to deal with sure and I think when they're asked to do a public speech class here right. or asked to right. do the interpersonal class, it's going to be harder and harder yeah. wow. in the workplace or in, yeah. you know. Scary set of circumstances we it leave sure everyone is. with here. But sure uh, I appreciate so much your time and, and uh, your expertise on this subject. And uh, just want to thank you for coming and being with us thank today. You for having me. We'll be right back. It's great to donate money to your favorite charities. Before you donate, it is important to know how your dollar is being spent. Charities have various costs and expenses. To find out how much of your donation actually goes to the specific charitable purpose rather than to pay costs and expenses, visit New Jersey Consumer Affairs online at njconsumeraffairs.gov or call 973-504-6215. Be an informed consumer. We can help. Our next guest is Professor Michelle Altieri. She's a professor of communication at County College of Morris. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> Would you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I went to Marist College in Poughkeepsie, New York, where I double majored in English and communication, and I minored in global studies. And then I went on to Illinois State University, where I got a master's in communication. Great. 
And uh, you got your start in the work world at Illinois, or? Um, partly, yes. I actually um, I got lucky enough to get a nonprofit internship when I was at Marist with the, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society up in Albany, New York. And it was great to kind of learn the ins and outs of the nonprofit world through that. And then while I was at Illinois State, I actually had an internship for almost two years where I interned at Caterpillar, so I got to see more of the, cor the corporate communication mm -hmm. world. And then also at ISU, I also got to start teaching in the, in the college classroom. So that's when I figured out that's what I was passionate about. And you've been here for about six years? Yes, this is my sixth year here. Great, great. Yep. Well, we'll turn our attention now to the video and uh, let's see some of the responses <laughs> that we got uh, to the questions about relationships. Excellent. <laughs> Do you know that with the many people we meet, only a handful will truly mean something to us? A relationship is the way in which two or more concepts, objects, or people are connected. Connection is such a powerful concept. It literally determines how one lives his or her life. From birth, we need the mother who nurtures, the friend who listens, the mentor who teaches, and the spouse who holds. We even hold dear animal companions who belong to us and to whom we belong. Relationships mean more to us than we even realize. So my name is Michelle. I am almost 49. Hi, my name is uh, Robert Galski. I'm 19 years old. Uh, my name is Lawrence. I'm 20. Okay. My name is Deb Butler. I'm 55 years old. Uh, Patrick Linus, 18 years old. Hi, my name is Nicole Marguerite. I'm 22. Janine Malini. I'm 58 years old. Hello, my name is M. Kualik, I'm 22 years old, and uh, my most significant relationship would have to be with my father because uh, he's a great guy, hard worker, and he leads me in the right direction in life. So. Okay. My name is Jürgen Rupel, and I'm 54 years old. Uh, the most important person in my life is my wife. We've been married now for 28 years. And my most significant relationship, I reckon, my sister. I'm the most significant. That would be my girlfriend. I've known for about three months now. So, yeah. My significant relationship of all would be my husband. We've been married since I've been 27. My name is Brian. I'm 32 years old, and my most significant relationship is with my mother. She's been the one person that hasn't wavered in my corner. Uh, my father gave me good advice on life. And uh, I look up to him. Okay. Hi, my name is Mohamed Sabeh. I'm 18 years old. And the most important person in my life is uh, my brother. Uh, because he's always there for me and he supports me when, I'm, when I need him. Our most significant relationship is with my father. He's a very good influence on me. And we spend a lot of time together. We do a lot of activities together. Imran Aslam. I'm from uh, Pakistan and my most significant relation is with my wife. Her name is Sahar. I love her. She's the, she's the most beautiful thing ever happened to me. And she's the most beautiful girl I have ever met. Hi, my name is Sydney. I'm 16 and my most significant relationship is with my parents. I depend on them so much and they always, they do so much for me. My grandma. Because she's been there for me more than my mom and dad. She gave me advice. She's taught me for my two rights. We have a really good relationship. I have to say my most significant relationship is with my parents and sister. Just my family in general, they're always there for me. And it's just nice having a close-knit family. My most significant relationship would be with my husband, Paul. We've been married 37 years. And it's uh, just evolved from, it's a loving relationship, long term, and very supportive, and um, he's a great guy. 
I would like to talk about my most significant relationship, which is with my husband. He is a wonderful man, and he has spent my entire life making me happy, and I couldn't live without him. My most significant relationship is with my parents, because uh, I think they're the people who are the most important in my life. Uh, they give me a really, really good education, and I thank a lot for that. And they also give me uh, a lot of love, and they help me uh, just all the time when I need them. When I need them, so I think it's well that, and I love them so much. <laughs> My most significant relationship, I would say, was my mom's relationship. Um, she passed away five years ago, but she taught me a lot about um, hard work and to love myself. Um, a lot of people struggle with that nowadays. People are always, um, mostly in relationships, they lose themselves because they're loving the other person more than they love themselves. So she really taught me that. Um, and about working hard is that nobody's ever going to work as hard as you do and nobody's going to care about you as more as, as more as you do. So, um, yeah, that was my most significant relationship with my mother. Well, lots to talk about there. <laughs> yes. um, let me begin our conversation with a very simple question, and that is what makes a significant relationship significant? <laughs> I think a lot of factors go into play. It might depend on the person or it might depend on the relationship. But some of the themes, at least the people in the, com in the interview were talking about were longevity, you know, people that were going to be around for a while. Most of the people talked about having some kind of positive influence on them, so some kind of love, support, and definitely having some kind of trustworthiness and compassion involved. Right. Right. Um, they talked about, um, it, it seemed as though they broke it into, their, the young people spoke about their families, mm -hmm. and then the older folks spoke about uh, their, their marriages, their spouses. Uh, I suppose from a generational standpoint, that makes a lot of sense, given who is significant and, and present. In Absolutely. Our lives. Absolutely. The family unit is the first, the first influencing factor that's going to come into play with anyone's life. Mm -hmm. You know, especially before you enter school, the mother, the father, any potential siblings are going to be the first people that are going to have a say in what you see around you, what, what's considered normal. And then when you get older, then the school, you know, school life starts to come into play with peers and, t and teachers and mentors. So you start to have an outside viewpoint of what maybe you like and don't like, and not just what's normal to you and your family, but what's normal to the outside world or what's accepted by the outside world. So absolutely, that makes sense that especially younger generations would focus on, especially their parents and their siblings as the most significant, because they're the, really the only long-lasting you know, long relationship that they've had so far in most people's lives. Mm -hmm. I don't think we heard too much from the 30-somethings, the or <laughs> you know, 40 even. Mm -hmm. and, and that's probably that transition time from, you know, maybe your parents pass away or, you know, siblings, you disconnect from that yeah. initial unit and move on to one you create. Sure, and, and in, in that generation, a lot of the focus and time is spent on the career. So mm -hmm. it would be interesting to find out if there was a coworker or a boss supervisor or even mm -hmm. friendship and, and during mm -hmm. that time is typically a really significant influence. And uh, lots of times, 20-somethings, um, 30-somethings, even sometimes in the early 40s, tend to or go to the friendships in their lives first before going to other places to get advice or to get support. Right, right. And we heard in the initial uh, taping about mentors, <laughs> and but not so much in the comments of those individuals on the tape. Yes. Uh, so to your point, the, the business mentor to a 30-something uh, yep. could be a very powerful influence and, and relationship of sorts, significant certainly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Certainly, maybe not the love kind, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway. If we speak a little bit more about that family uh, that we have when we're young and, mm -hmm. and how important they are in our relationships, can you speak a little bit to the differences in cultures in that regard? Sure. Culture, cultural influences can have a really significant you know, say in 
what, what's normal and what trends happen. Um, obviously, in some cultures, you know, th right from the start, all family members are pretty much considered to be equal on, you know, on standard footing. So if there was a dispute or if there was a family decision, mothers, fathers, siblings would all kind of get together and have a conversation and the, the family unit would decide how to move forward. And, and very much differently in other cultures, there tends to be a very power, a very significant power difference between the par the, par the parents and mm -hmm. the children, and um, it's kind of interesting to see how there's usually some kind of rite of passage, whether there's a certain age that's reached, or there's some kind of life event that happens that signifies the child is no longer a child but is now an adult, and usually that results in a very significant change in responsibilities and communication patterns that mm -hmm. happen between the parents and the child, mm -hmm. and even just um, the expectations of what happens in the future. And I guess it sends a clear message to the child slash adult that they need to look outward uh, to develop <laughs> relationships Absolutely. more than they ever have. Absolutely, definitely. Worker. Great, great. Were there any surprises in the video? <laughs> any? Um, a, couple of, a couple of surprises. One that struck me was the gentleman that said the three-month relationship was the most significant relationship mm -hmm. in his life. Mm -hmm. I wondered if he understood uh, kind of the depth of the question of where, <laughs> the, the, where they were leading. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it very well could be that in his life there was no real um, strong, long-lasting influence that had happened mm -hmm. before that. And that three-month time was really a, a really trend, um, significant moment for him. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of an interesting one that stuck out. And then just a lack of having a teacher or some kind of mentor in the responses I was kind of surprised by. I know um, when I had asked the question to some of my peers and some of my friends, they fondly remembered a teacher or someone significant that had sh shaped them when they were younger and kind of led them to the career that they had chosen or um, you know, kind of influenced them when maybe their parents weren't that strong of an influence. So mm -hmm. I was kind of surprised that that wasn't mentioned more. but. Uh, some of the themes, you know, weren't really that surprising. The parents, the siblings, and definitely the spouses. I kind of mm -hmm. was expecting to hear from, from the people. Right. So uh, while we're on the, the subject sort of, of of the cultural differences, what about mm -hmm. gender differences? How do the genders differ in how they look at relationships? Well, I thought one interesting thing that people were responding with is m most of the time, if a male was responding, he had picked a male um, person that was the relationship mm -hmm. to identify. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times, a female a respondent would pick a female role model in her life, that, or a, you know, a female relationship to kind of focus on, especially in the family. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the times, we we kind of think back to who do we relate to, who can we kind of um, mimic in what we think we should be like when we grow up. Mm -hmm. So especially you know, when a, a son would say his father would be his most significant relationship. In a lot of families, it makes a lot of sense because, you know, kind of the parent that you can identify most with is going to be the person you want to mimic and kind of want to honor with the mm -hmm. decisions that you make. And hopefully mm -hmm. would want to um, kind of follow in their footsteps with what we consider to be the best way to be. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking at those individuals that we seek out as role models and want to pattern ourselves after, what are the qualities that, that you think we look for in the relationships that we establish. Sure, I think some of the qualities would be even something basic as love, you know, that uh, the, out, the outpouring of people that said that just that unconditional love and support, and they kind of chuckled and said, no matter what I did, you know, mom or dad or my sister or brother would be there for me. In my corner. Exactly, yeah. right. <laughs> exactly. Right. So kind of having that unconditional support, I think was a big factor. Mm -hmm. I think other things that might have come into play was the idea of having someone to have faith in you, you know, kind of mm -hmm. that, that positive, um, kind of push to be a better person and to kind of be who you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought it was interesting too that when you asked, when they were asked who's significant, no one had a negative response, at least that we got to see. Mm -hmm. So to mm -hmm. them, significant equaled positive. You know, most people had a smile on their face as they thought about mm -hmm. a wife or a father or a mother or a sister. Um, and I thought mm -hmm. that was kind of interesting that significant meant a good, strong, positive influence on someone. Yeah, I like that it did, but clearly yeah. there can be significant negative influences Absolutely. in our lives as well. Absolutely. And uh, that would be another whole conversation, <laughs> I think. But, uh, yep. but to your point, it, it, uh, it, I, w I also was struck by uh, the fact that they all went in one direction. I really thought there'd be a lot more talk of love relationships mm -hmm. than there was, and certainly 
if you've been married as many years as some of them have been, <laughs> uh, it's going to be, come down to that, that love relationship or that, that spousal Definitely. relationship, which, which makes it very different. So uh, we've covered gender and culture. Let's look then at, since it's a generational kind of approach that we're taking, how does our definition of significant change as we get older? Well, I think a big factor that causes it to change would be choice. You know, when you're little and when you're, uh, even when you're growing up in your teenage years, you don't really have a lot of choice of who's around you. You have a family unit that you can't really escape if you want to. Um, you, you're in school with certain people that you are around a lot of the times. And whether or not you like them or want to be around them, you kind of are stuck with them. Mm -hmm. And then once your college years and beyond hit, you really do have more of a say in who you want to be around you. And you have a lot of, um, hopefully, good influence on who, the people that are in your mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. So I think one thing that we can kind of look at to why have the respondents have differing, differing opinions, you know, when they, the younger generations are asked this question, they have to look at the people kind of forced, <laughs> for lack of a better mm -hmm. word, mm -hmm. to be around them. Um, and then when they're older, they kind of have more of a say in who, who they pick and choose. Mm -hmm. um, so it would make sense that they would kind of lean toward the spouse or somebody like that. that and maybe, you know, they're kind of proud of that. I think that's kind of interesting, too. You know, a lot of the times we're kind of looked at and who we have around us is reflective of us as a person. Right. So, you know, mm -hmm. especially the people that we're talking about, uh, good support or the most, you know, the most beautiful person that they know and um, the, pe the person that makes them laugh or supports them or whatever their other answers mm -hmm. would be. It not only makes the other person look really great, but it also mm -hmm. kind of makes us look great. Like, wow, look at us. We had, we made a really good decision to mm -hmm. have them around us. Mm -hmm. so. Right, right, right. <laughs> very good, very good. Uh, I wonder too now that we last, uh, in our last segment uh, with Professor Pallant, uh, we spoke about uh, social media mm -hmm. and the impact it has had on communication. And um, as we talk about relationships, how would you, um, what can you, what can you, um, offer in terms of how uh, the technology simply that we have today has impacted our communication uh, positively and <laughs> negatively? Absolutely. There's so much that could be said about that. When you think about it on different levels, uh, in the positive end, you know, it might make a relationship last longer than it might not have if you mm -hmm. didn't have the technology available. You know, mm -hmm. distance no longer really matters. We have Skyping and FaceTiming and other video chat type options so that we can see the person and connect with them on more of an intimate basis. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that we can text someone and check in with them really regularly without mm -hmm. a whole lot of commitment on our end tends right. to prolong relationships longer than it might otherwise. But even just things like social media, especially, you know, it's it, relationships aren't anywhere near as private as they used to be. Right. Which some might think that's positive and others might not think it's so positive. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, there's a whole outside world that's going to have a say in do they approve or not? Do they like mm -hmm. it or not? Um, mm -hmm. You know, do they think it's a good choice or not? And even just thinking about how posting something like a picture or a status update on Facebook or or posting something on Instagram or other social media outlets can really have an influence on, you know, if I get a lot of likes, maybe I'll do that behavior more. Right. So it might encourage right. certain behaviors within that relationship. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. obviously the opposite is true as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you've given us an awful lot of information. <laughs> uh, we could go on with the whole tweeting and instantaneous <laughs> communication and all of that. Uh, and I know there's a lot more that we could explore, uh, but you've given us a lot to think about and, and offered some tremendous insights and really appreciate your expertise and your being with us. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, on a, a final note, I guess, I would wonder what you think, th where we'll be five, 10 years from now in terms of communication, just real quickly, any thoughts on? I think we'll see a lot of the same. I don't anticipate a whole lot of significant changes, but no matter what kind of technologies change or how the world changes around us, and at our core as human beings, we crave those interpersonal relationships. That's kind of what we need to move on and to be successful and to feel worthwhile. So no matter what else changes, I think we'll still need our, you know, to have each other around us. Mm -hmm. Let's hope so, our support <laughs> network and all of that. So, yep. well, I do appreciate your time <laughs> and uh, we'll be right back after this message. Welcome to the new Department of Communication, where we prepare students for success in the global information economy by combining practical skills in media production, journalism, public relations, and interpersonal communication with theoretical insights into the evolving nature of media, aesthetics, and 
human relationships. Graduates will be prepared with what is perhaps the most valuable set of skills in the modern age, the ability to interpret and create effective messages in a variety of media forms while anticipating industry and social trends. Welcome back. Our next guest is Professor John Soltes. He's a professor of communication at County College of Morris. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. You bet. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, here at CCM, I, uh, I teach all the journalism classes. Um, I have a bachelor's from Rutgers University and a master's from Columbia University. Um, as a working journalist, I've been published in uh, the New York Times, um, at time.com, the Earth Island Journal, and a whole host of other publications. Um, mm -hmm. In New Jersey, I was the editor of a weekly newspaper for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, I freelance magazine articles, and I also uh, run an online magazine called Hollywood Soapbox. Great. Yeah. Wow, busy guy. <laughs> well, we've got some video to watch, so why don't we do that now, and we'll talk afterwards. Let's see the video. 25 years ago, less than 2% of the population owned a cell phone. Consider that cell phones make it possible for people to communicate not only in new ways, but more often. The question is, was communication better or worse prior to the advent of this technology? Is it possible to return to the way we communicated before the cell phone? Or is it even possible to live without a cell phone altogether? My name is Tony Muzzi Falcone. I'm Italian, uh, but I teach at NYU here in New York. And uh, I'm 72 years of age. My name is Paul. They say say my age if I want to, but my preference is not. Hello, my name is Jonathan Maldonado. I'm 23 years old. Um, okay, um, my name is Bex. I'm 30 years old. Um, my name is Catherine. I'm 25. My name is Martin Furman. I'm 21. I was, I'm from New York City. I'm Lene. I'm 13. I'm Dana, I'm 23. Uh, tonight, 24. My name is Maria. I'm from New Jersey. And Sandy. I'm, uh, wow, 74. I'll be 74. So, Monica. Uh, well, what would life be like without a cellular phone? It'd be like 1973 with no cellular phone. You can't beat around it. And life without a cell phone? but basically take us back to the caveman era. That's it. Um, I guess without a cell phone, life would be pretty tricky. Um, I use it for everything, so contacting friends, like navigation, getting around, eat work emails, um, just keeping in touch with people. So yeah, it would be pretty difficult without. I don't think I could ever live without my cell phone. <laughs> um, my phone is my everything, it's like my life, it's like my other hand, you know, I love it so much, it's like it's like a girlfriend of mine, you know, I'm going to keep it, but I can't live without it, no, I cannot. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah sure. Uh, life without a cell phone would put me out of a job. I actually work for Apple, technology has changed the way and people now revolve on it on a daily basis. I think it would be less stressful without Facebook and everything, people knowing every little detail about your life. And I live my life without the cell phone until from 30, 28 years ago, and certainly the cell phone has helped my life. It, it, it has improved my life. Uh, at the same time, I see that my students uh, live on their cell phones. I don't know. How would people reach me? Nobody would ever reach me. So. <laughs> I think it will get a lot more complicated than it already is because people have forgotten how to set up meetings without actually messaging each other. I think like life without cell phones wouldn't be that bad because there's like other ways to communicate with people, like you can talk to them. Um, I mean, it would be probably a little bit more difficult because most people use cell phones and like most people text each other and call each other and it's just convenient. But I think if like it, they didn't exist or we didn't have them, then like we could just find other ways to communicate. Yeah. And if I had to live without a cell phone, I probably wouldn't complain too much because life would be a lot more peaceful. And that's my opinion. Not sure. 
<laughs> it's still your cell phone. And uh, I've lived most of my life without cell phone, and I utilize it now, but not as crazy as a lot of other people. I could get along fine without it. Well, life without a cell phone would be amazing. For one reason, people would start talking to each other versus depending on a little on a little uh, gadget. Uh, people would also use their brain to uh, memorize and remember phone numbers. Uh, people would actually also would be able to start distinguishing north, south, east, west, would be able to use their brain again to be able to know where to go instead of just always depending on the gadget to tell you or Siri to go, you know, please turn right, please turn left. So your generation that uh, just looks at the gadget as the problem solver, really what it's doing is, is making you a slave to this little gadget and making you numb in your brain. Because remember that your brain will only function if you exercise it. Well, clearly, people see things differently when it comes to cell phones. Um, how have cell phones impacted the way we communicate, just in the most basic sense? Sure, absolutely. Um, it's changed tremendously, and it probably will never go back to the pre-cell phone years. Um, it has changed relationships, added them, and taken them away. Um, and also, when you look at how many people actually have a cell phone, the, the numbers are staggering. Uh, the Pew Research Center, um, a resource that I use in the classroom, tells us that 90% of Americans now have a cell phone. And when you're talking about smartphones, the numbers are quite high too, and they cut across many different generations. Mm -hmm. So it's tremendously. Yeah, uh, I got the impression that there's some dependency <laughs> on the part of some of the folks who are speaking on the video uh, in terms of, well, let's just look at how, how we keep track of our daily routines. I think that's become a, a crutch of sort. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And I, I think a dependency is the right word. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think the smartphone is asked to do a lot for every generation now. It's their means of connecting to the outside world through text and email. Mm -hmm. uh, it's their means of connecting to the internet. It's their means of taking photo and video. It's their means of updating social media plugins. So you're talking about um, sort of a complete overhaul of their life is now in their pocket. Um, and, and that's, you know, something to be, you know, I think praised in some ways that the technology has come this far, you know, so um, so fast and so forward, uh, so quickly. But also something that we have to sort of keep in mind culturally. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly it sets the alarm to get us up in the morning. It reminds us when we need to be at a certain place, and uh, whether it's a dentist appointment or you know. Uh, but I think too, the the young man spoke of how would you possibly set up a meeting? Sure. Yeah, yeah, there's this yeah. sort of an art that has been lost on how to do this uh, manually or just sort of by calling someone on the phone. So, um, you know, a day without a smartphone or a day without a cell phone is, it's kind of like a day um, after Hurricane Sandy hit New Jersey um, when electricity was out for so many people. Um, the smartphone eventually drained. And for a few hours there, um, the frantic sort of uh, actions of people were not, you know, yes, they were gasoline and they were trying to sort of figure out if everything's okay. It was also sort of having these sort of new communities form at malls to charge their smartphones, right. uh, to have that feeling of connection again. And imagine while they were charging those phones, they had to talk to each other. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> and uh, possibly, uh, possibly have a longer conversation than they would right, have. Full sentences. Text. Yeah, and well, correct grammar. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Well, yeah. we can't be sure about that. But uh, I know, too, that one, the, the older folks spoke of not being as panicked at the thought because they grew up without them. And I, I think that there is a, just a, a fear uh, on the part of the young people. They just don't know how that would go. Sure, you know? absolutely. And, and I, I think that's a, that's a real expectation that if you were to have sort of this dystopian world where smartphones were, would be gone for a few hours for a day, you would have, I think, older generations who grew up that way and who are just much more comfortable with one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction and, and finding their news and their entertainment right. elsewhere, they would probably fit into that world better than uh, maybe a millennial or uh, certainly mm -hmm. a digital native. Um, mm -hmm. I think of sort of, you know, today's generation of growing up, 
often they don't know sort of you know how to operate a car that's manual shift uh, you know right, um, because right. they don't have to right, uh, that right. often and yeah. they've grown up with automatic um, so yeah. it'll be similar to that right right gone are the days when a phone is a phone sure and, uh, now it's so much more uh, they did speak of of needing it again almost like an addiction um, and the one girl said how would people find me um, so I think there's a certain level of, of fear of being disconnected, not just socially, but, but completely out of, out of contact with the human race if you don't have your phone. Sure, yeah. Which is and my journalism students, they do a lot of technology stories, and a couple of them have sort of followed that trend. And, you know, why exactly do we need to sort of literally go to our phone every couple minutes? And often right. the response is, if you don't, you feel disconnected from family, right. friends, celebrities, sports figures, game right. scores. I need right. to have that immediate. Um, and that's a larger cultural issue of, of immediacy it when it comes to the news product. It is, and certainly a generational different, the, the difference. I remember the Vietnam War being the first televised war. Well, now yeah. you know every move everybody's making everywhere in the world, sure. uh, which is a good thing, but yeah. it certainly suggests that we just aren't willing to, no, to wait for news or yeah. whether it's entertainment or or otherwise yeah. so with any new technology there has to be an assessment at the cultural level at the communication level of the benefits and then the drawbacks of of that um, technology right right yeah. well let's get personal here how many apps do you have <laughs> on your phone I have a number of apps I, I definitely do I can tell you my favorite one is uh, something called Zite um, mm -hmm. it's one of the top news apps in in America I actually introduce it in the classroom a bit um, because it actually, it, it works perfectly on a cultural discussion of why we even have apps and smartphones. Um, it, it allows me essentially to customize my news experience. Um, mm -hmm. The days of picking up that newspaper on the front step and sort of having someone tell you this is the front page, this is the sports section, this is entertainment, that's very much of an old idea. We like our newspapers to be created according to our own interests. So mm -hmm. my confession is that I got Zeit. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, in the summer during Shark Week. Uh, so, uh, uh -huh. We know I, more about you now than we did before. There we go. Right. So I have a shark page on my news app, essentially, and every day or every week I can check in and see what the shark news is. And that's mm -hmm. just because mm -hmm. I happen to like wildlife. Someone mm -hmm. else is going to have the Jets or the Mets or the Yankees mm -hmm. or politics or Barack Obama. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How does this, um, uh, and I guess if you don't have it on, you, you know, the phone has become your computer, your laptop, your, you, you can print to a wireless printer. How about all that other technology? What's to become of, do you, do you see us moving in the direction of, say, five years from now, one device that can do everything? Uh, we're kind of there. But. Yeah, no, definitely. I think they'll they'll keep going and keep going and sort of, um, the idea was that it was going to keep going, getting smaller. The actual device would get right. smaller and smaller. Right. Um, now I think they've realized that they've gotten a little bit too small and now we have mm -hmm. tablets. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. uh, it's the viewing experience. Do we all watch television? Some of us do, um, but some of us prefer to watch those programs on a device that's just much more, much closer and much more intimate. Mm -hmm. So I think they're going to continue to enhance that intimate feeling of, of trying to access news and stories and emails on a device that's only about two feet from your eyes. Um, mm -hmm. So I s where, that's where I see the technology sort of leading, uh, continuing this intimacy um, mm -hmm. that, that sort of has taken us from literally the television, which is what, 15 feet away when you mm -hmm. watch it, mm -hmm. um, to the newspaper, which is mm -hmm. about five feet away when you're holding mm -hmm. it out from you. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a little too far. <laughs> <laughs> right, five feet. I can't hold five feet. Right. And then right. the smartphone, which is in right. your pocket. It's, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's right there with you. Mm -hmm. But I think of big screen TVs and IMAX theaters and, you know, scoreboards in new stadiums that are as big as the field itself and, sure. and uh, the court. So aren't you supposed to watch certain things on the big screen? And, and can we really do everything well is there a one-size-fits-all sure i don't the think technology? there is there'll always be a need for other technologies and media to access that what i can mm -hmm. see is kind of them working in tandem mm -hmm. maybe um a smartphone giving you the score and then you go home and watch the game on your right. sort of your, your big screen tv mm -hmm. um I, I doubt we're going to get to a culture that's going to watch the super bowl on the smartphone right. but 
during the Super Bowl to enhance that viewing experience, I'm going to be checking my social media and seeing what the world's saying about the game that I'm All watching. Right. So it's kind of in tandem and in, as, a, as sort of an addition to the media experience elsewhere. Right, right, right. Uh, let's just shift for a minute to, to the, another big issue, and that is uh, how people feel about cell phones being just everywhere and, and eavesdropping and try, you know, sure. if you could speak just a little bit to, to the differences generationally, I would imagine. Absolutely. We saw a little of that in the yeah. video. Yeah, and the video I think definitely shows a little bit. Some of the, the older folks, maybe the baby boomer generation, there, there's some skepticism, maybe mm -hmm. even animosity to some mm -hmm. of this, these new trends um, because they're looking at it from sort of, I have to catch up with the younger people mm -hmm. and the younger people perhaps are not letting me communicate oh. uh, according to the way I prefer to communicate. So mm -hmm. I kind of have to learn their device and learn their language. And, mm -hmm. and let's be honest, uh, we don't have to sort of, uh, 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 sort of hedge around this. The language that is used on text messages and emails and anything sort of dealing with a smartphone can often be a very relaxed, uh, mm -hmm. almost slang kind, kind of language. Yeah. And often across all generations, but maybe in particular the millennials, they sometimes have difficulty trying to stop that language and start something right. a little bit more professional in right. a face-to-face -face right. setting. And that's, a, from a baby boomer's perspective, that's another whole conversation. <laughs> so I really appreciate your being with us here today. Uh, it's just been enlightening. And as I say, a conversation that, that could and should go on. Uh, so thanks very much for being with us today. And uh, we'll be right back. Hello? Grandma, something happened last night. I'm in trouble and I need your help. Oh no, dear, what happened? You don't sound like yourself. I was in a car accident and my nose is broken. I'd do anything for you, honey. How can I help? I need $3,000 to pay for a lawyer and to pay for my hospital costs. The money needs to be wired immediately, but please don't tell mom and dad. Just to be safe, please tell me the family code word so I know it's really you. Welcome back to Generations. Our next and final guest is Dr. Matthew Jones. He's the chair of our communication department here at County College of Morris and a professor of communication as well. Welcome. Thank you very much, Denise. Could you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. Well, my career in communication started at the William Patterson College at the time of New Jersey, now William Patterson University, where I earned a Bachelor of Arts in Communication Arts. Um, and I did that primarily because I was interested in filmmaking and wanted better access to film equipment. Uh, following that, I continued along and earned a master's degree in media studies also from William Patterson University before going on to complete my doctorate in media and communication uh, at Temple University with uh, Dr. Matthew Lombard. Mm -hmm. Great. And I believe you had some filmmaking experience along the way or production and Sure. I, yeah, I interned um, at a local uh, small video production house mm -hmm. at the time, David's Productions, who specialized in uh, industrial and pharmaceutical videos. But in college, I, I was really interested also in sort of producing my own short um, independent films as well. And you did. Sure. We'll talk about that if <laughs> we have time. That's great. In the meantime, let's look at the video that the students have put together. Absolutely. Fictional characters have influenced and shaped thoughts and behaviors for generations. Over the years, fictional beings have been used as a form of entertainment, a means to learn, a way to escape reality, and even a technique for better communication. What is it that makes fictional characters so appealing, regardless of the difference in generation? As you'll see, the similarities and differences are as assorted and interesting as the people who responded. Gene, I'm 41 years old. Well, my name is Dan Wilkins, and uh, I am 63 years young. My name is Brian, and I'm 19. Hi, my name is Mike, 23. Hi, I'm Vivian. I'm 58 years old. Uh, my name is Keely. I'm 11 years old. I'm Maureen Taylor, 67. Julie McDonald, I'm 40. My name is Regina Anthony, and I'm 59 years old. My name is Kate Jacobs. I'm 23 years old. 
name is Jamie, age is 55. My name is Kaylee Williams, and I'm 10 years old. My name is Gemma, I'm 53. I am Michael, and I am 65 years old. Ira Barreto, 33. Hi, my name is Carly Sherwood, I'm 19 years old. My name is Dejanay Lopez, I am 23 years old. My name is Beverly Williams, I'm 55. Hi, I'm Art, and I'm 58, soon to be 59. My somewhat fictional human character would be Bruce Lee. The reason why is he was an inspiring man, extremely strong in body and in mind, and he died way before his time. He inspired me to be as strong as I could, even though a disability that I had been blessed and cursed with. I have been known to do many weird things, but kind of like almost in the way of his path. I've done many teachings by him and I've learned a great deal in amount. Hopefully I can pass it on to the future generation. And if I could be any fictional character, I would be Jack Ryan, because he's smart and a badass. But if I were to choose a fictional character that I would want to be, I've got to choose Superman. Uh, probably just because my son likes Superman so much. And who could not want to be Superman? He's pretty awesome. He's pretty indestructible. So I would definitely go with Superman. I want to be Percy Jackson. I want to be Percy Jackson because he's cool and I'm cool and he's smart and I'm smart and a lot of other reasons about him. And he has a really nice mother and I have a really nice mother. And his father's really strong and likes water. My father's he likes one. I would like to be Dumbledore or Gandalf the Grey because they both have uh, very long beards and special powers. I would be Terry Ames, student nurse, because I read her whole series of books and that's why I became a nurse. And if I wanted to be any fictional character, I'd probably be Triss from Divergent because she's a badass. And I think she's very like empowering a woman. I would love to be Cinderella because I want to live happily ever after. And I would like to be, I don't have a, a name for this person, but there was a Matt Damon movie where, and it's fictional of course, where he could talk to people who were dead. And the reason I liked it was when you lose someone close, you're in emotional pain and he was able to connect the family member with the person who died and ease their pain and I sort of like that. He did it reluctantly but he had this gift and uh, that's what I'd like to be able to do. That's who I'd like to be. And if I could be any fictional character, well, I'm not sure about any of them, but one I would choose is the great Waldo Pepper. I guess he was a wonderful pilot back in World War I and he went on and became a foreign soldier. And uh, he is one of my heroes. And in fact, in honor of him, I'm getting my own biplane in just a couple of weeks. And I'm excited about that. Great Waldo Pepper. I'm not sure who he is. Watch the movie. I would be Katniss because she gets to live outside the woods and she's very self sufficient. And my answer is Goodness Jenkins. It's a character from a book I read when I was a kid called Goodness and Mercy Jenkins about two Quaker girls who were very courageous from abolitionist families and um, I don't know, they were just tough little girls and I, I remember that vividly. Like, just really admired them. Um, Superman, because he's indestructible and I don't think this country, this world's got a lot of kryptonite. So I would like to live forever. And I would like to be Annie Beth from the Percy Jackson series. She's the daughter of Athena and goddess of wisdom and I think that it would be really cool to be her because she she always knows everything and she's a goddess of well the daintiness of strategy. So if I could be any fictional character I would most likely be Hermione Granger because she always has her nose in a book and she seems to have the answer for just about everything. I think I would be Huckleberry Finn and I think the reason I would be him is because he had such a sense of adventure, and he had courage. He would be Harry from Harry Met Sally. Two reasons. One is that people say that that's how he used to look alike, but he's also kind of an archetype of my generation. If 
I could be any fictional character, I'd be Katniss from The Hunger Games. She's badass. <laughs> and she gets to choose between two Hawkeyes. The fictional character that I like to be is Batman because the world's depending on him. Um, Batman was my favorite superhero growing up, still is to this day. Um, and yeah, basically just because, you know, he comes in, saves the innocent people, and he's like a, a good role model. And if I could be any fictional character, I would love to be Mary Poppins. You know why? This bag isn't big enough to pull stuff out of. I would love to be able to have an endless bag just pulling things out. Lots of choices there, lots of uh, different responses to the fictional character question. Yes. Um, given that, uh, what is it that attracts an individual to a specific, a certain fictional character? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Uh, I think that one of the main reasons that people are attracted to particular characters or latch on to maybe having a favorite character uh, is uh, this idea of identification. So. When we observe fiction, whether it's in film or uh, in literature, we notice that character has have particular characteristics. And if we have characteristics, physical, occupational, temperamental, that match theirs, we tend to identify with them and uh, like them more. And I suppose the opposite is true. If they're strong where we perceive ourselves to be weak, we might like that they're not us. Sure, yeah. I mean, th uh, if, we ca if we're okay stepping outside of uh, who we know we are, um, then we might be okay, you know, we, or, or if we desire a particular characteristic we don't possess, uh, I think fiction can serve as a sort of wish fulfillment, um, just like uh, Freud argued that dreams so uh, serve as a sort of wish fulfillment. Right. Uh, so we can make up for deficiencies that we might have in a fantasy world through fiction. Again, either film, literature, television, or right. any other form any of media. Any way we can, I guess, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the, there were a lot of young, strong female mm -hmm. characters mm -hmm. uh, chosen. Um, right. Is that something that surprised you? or? Would you say that's... No, not at all. I think that um, especially the character uh, Katniss w was mentioned um, and uh, the term uh, in quotes badass was, was repeated mm -hmm. by um, both genders uh, I think three or four times mm -hmm. in that segment. Um, I think that, that uh, traditionally when you look at female characters, uh, if one analysis uh, that's given to us by Laura Mulvey who's a film theorist uh, who did a lot of work in the 1970s, uh, wrote a very famous article called uh, Visual Pleasure in the Narrative Cinema from 1975. And in this article she argues that we are conditioned as an audience, both men and women, to perceive the world, at least the world of movies, through the gaze of men. So, um, you know, traditionally speaking, uh, that left the female character being sort of objectified <clears throat> and, um, and, and, and not as an agent or an actor, uh, mm -hmm. but a more passive figure. I think that when you look at characters like Katniss, for example, from The Hunger Games, uh, you see a, re a reaction to that uh, with a character that is uh, very active, um, not passive, doesn't take any nonsense, and um, you know, stands up for what she believes, and uh, many would argue, I think, correctly, that that is a much more uh, healthy role model. Mm -hmm. I think back to the assistants that worked with uh, James Bond and mm -hmm. Clark Kent's, uh, you know, assistant, and, and th those females certainly represent what you're suggesting. The old. Mm -hmm. kind of stereotype Yes, was. Laura Mulvey was talking specifically mm -hmm. about film, but that certainly mm -hmm. uh, applies 100% mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about the fact that people tend to choose either a hero or a villain? Right. Real extremes, I guess. Well, I think that, um, that that's true. I, I, interestingly, uh, there's a phenomenon um, in film theory called perverse identification, uh -huh. where people uh, identify with characters who are explicitly bad. and um, and on a wide scale too. Take for example a film like um, Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. Uh, and at the mm -hmm. f at the end of the film, uh, you know, uh, you're not meant to to hate Hannibal Lecter. I don't mm -hmm. think, even though he's uh, really deviant 
Um, he finishes off the film with, uh, I think the line is, um, I have someone to dine on, and he's talking about the warden of the prison, who is a character who's really bad, and so we take a certain pleasure yeah. in seeing Hannibal Lecter uh, go off to, um, you know, do what he's gonna do to the, to the warden. You're right, and how can you not hate the guy? Mm -hmm. We don't. Good film, good film. Um, so if we, how about the, the, those characters that are, are both bad and good, mm -hmm. uh, Robin Hood, for example, yeah. or um, any number of them, mm -hmm. Batman. Batman. How do we explain those choices? Sure, um, I think that uh, a situation like that um, demonstrates the the duality of humanity. We all have two sides to us. Um, it's you know, life is complicated, and mm -hmm. we make good choices and bad choices. We have parts of ourselves that are altruistic at times and parts of ourselves that are selfish at other times. And so we all have, I think if you want to use the terms good and evil, uh, you can go ahead and apply that and say that maybe we each have those aspects uh, within ourselves. And I think that might actually be a, a treasured thing. It's kind of funny. Um, recently I was, I was listening to a piece of, um, of, of German music and um, in it, uh, they have this, actually the song was by a band named uh, Megahertz, and it was about Rumpelstiltskin, a fictional character that you can identify with or not identify with as you please. But in it, um, there's, they, they mention this term, uh, das Allerweltsgesicht, which means your everyday face. And um, I thought of it because that, I think, is what people like uh, certainly what I like uh, when I experience certain characters like Batman, mm -hmm. that you have two, two parts of yourself, one that you present to uh, yeah. the, the, the whole world and, and another part mm -hmm. that is a little bit more calculated, mm -hmm. a little bit darker, um, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. yeah. It's also telling us that it's okay to be both. Sure. You know, in, in some ways. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But there, you about, have a character that has multiple dimensions right, to it. Right, right, as we do, absolutely. How about, um, the, the, there's some thought that maybe it's not so much the characters that we identify with, but their journeys. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that? Sure. Um, I, I think that there, at least in, in film, there's an old distinction uh, that I don't know if, I don't really know if it holds up anymore, that uh, American films, Hollywood films in particular, are more plot driven, mm -hmm. and in, mm -hmm. in Europe, films tend to be more character-driven and uh, centered on the development of character. However, I don't see these mm -hmm. things as um, you know, necessarily completely separate. Right. In fact, the mm -hmm. only way we know about a character is by the plot uh, and the actions that that character performs within the context mm -hmm. of the plot. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And the only way we know plot is through character, too. So we're so really liking the journey at the same absolutely. time. Absolutely. Yeah, the journey, is a, means, the journey yeah. is a means for the character to be able to become who he or she really is. Right, right. So if you had to choose a fictional character, who would you choose? I think I would go with uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi from, uh, uh -huh. from Star Wars. Uh -huh. Um, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi is a teacher, uh, and so am I, uh -huh. and uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi uh, comes from a lineage of teachers, and they make that clear in the, in the story, and uh, that's why I like him. He kind of comes out of nowhere and, and, um, and, and, and meets Luke. And yeah. 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 All-knowing. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to think our teachers are. That's a good thing. <laughs> what you want to be as a teacher, that's great. Well, I can't thank you enough for being with us. Uh, I'd like to thank our other earlier guests, um, Professor uh, Michelle Altieri, Professor David Pallant, and Professor John Soltes. Uh, and again, thanks so much for being here to talk about our fictional fantasy characters. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you.